Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So I want to welcome everyone to uh, the fifth of the ISO RED webinar series on community building in radiation epidemiology and dosimetry research. Um, and we're really delighted to have the opportunity to feature in today's webinar, epidemiology and dosimetry research uh, that's going on at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee in the United States. Um, this is a terrific group uh, that has been doing research um, across a variety of different pediatric um, groups. And today we have four talks. Uh, the first uh, will be describing the training and research at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital to give you a sense of the makeup of this group um, and the different people who are working there. And then we'll have three scientific talks. Um, so I'll introduce each speaker briefly before their talk, um, but just wanted to refer you all to the chat box. So we'll feature questions at the end of each of the scientific talks. If you'd like to raise your hand um, and then unmute yourself, I'm hoping that will work with the way we've set up the Zoom. Um, and that will, it's always nice if people can ask questions in person, that's not always possible, in which case feel free to put your questions in the chat box. Um, so with that, I will welcome uh, Dr. Linda Harris, who's the Director of Talent Acquisition at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and we look forward to hearing about training and research there. Thank you, Linda. Okay, um, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, speak today. Um, I'm just going to give like, a brief overview of uh, training and research at, at St. Jude. So the um, mission of St. Jude is to advance cures and means of prevention for pediatric catastrophic diseases uh, through research and treatment. Uh, we're an institute that's located in the north part of uh, downtown Memphis um, in Tennessee. Um, and we're a nonprofit basic research institute and a hospital. And we're housed together in the same facility. And it's devoted um, into basic biomedical research and treatment of uh, pediatric diseases. Um, on our campus, uh, we have the uh, ALSAC headquarters. Uh, ALSAC is the fundraising arm of St. Jude, and they do an amazing job at raising the funds that keep the hospital going. Um, our running costs right now are over $3 million a day, so we're very thankful uh, for all, the, all our donors. The scientific community at St. Jude um, is made up of about 140 uh, basic and translational research faculty. We also have an additional 120 clinical fellows, clinical faculty, I'm sorry. Um, our largest trainee population are postdoctoral fellows. We have about 280 right now, um, about 50 clinical fellows, and then uh, around 110 PhD students. Uh, we have our own um, standalone uh, PhD program, um, the uh, Biomedical uh, Graduate School at St. Jude. Uh, but we also uh, take students from the University of Tennessee because many of our faculty have joint appointments um, over at UT. So the students do research in the labs at St. Jude and then get their degrees from UT. Uh, we also have about 100 um, interns um, every year, uh, mainly during the summer. Um, and a lot of these come through our pediatric oncology education program. And then we have a number that come from Rhodes College, which is a local liberal arts school. Um, and they also do work during the semester as well. The research areas at St. Jude are very broad. Uh, we do have quite a large cancer focus, um, but we um, also, as you can see, have a wide variety of different research areas. Um, some very basic science, uh, like developmental biology, developmental neuroscience, and also research in immunology, infectious diseases, um, structural biology, um, as well as um, epidemiology um, through the Epidemiology Cancer Control uh, Department primarily. If you're interested in learning more about the different research areas at St. Jude, I encourage you to go to this website stjude.org backslash faculty. This will list all the different faculty at St. Jude um, with a, like a brief one-line description of what they work on. And you can click on their names and get go to their full web page to learn a lot more. The St. Jude is rapidly expanding. Uh, we've just opened a new, brand new $412 million research center. And we've just announced our new strategic plan for the next um, six years. Uh, which is an $11.5 billion expansion, which is going to include a lot of new construction and uh, 1,400 new jobs. We're actually increasing our faculty by 33% by over the next six years. 
Um, is this going to allow us to open up uh, some new centers of excellence, um, including pediatric neurological diseases, uh, data-driven discovery, innate immunity and inflammation, and also um, spatial transcriptomics, uh, which we're excited is going to include a cryo-EM tomography center. $100 million is going into our expanding our St. Jude Global. Um, global is where we are trying to improve the treatment for um, pediatric catastrophic diseases worldwide. And this expansion is going to allow us to actually develop physical hubs in seven regions of the world and will allow us to run St. Jude clinical trials worldwide. Uh, we're also collaborating with UNICEF and the World Health Organization to develop a worldwide drug distribution program to make sure that low and middle income countries can get all the drugs they need uh, to treat their patients. St. Jude investigators benefit from a wide variety of shared resources at St. Jude. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but basically they're all run by a dedicated director. And if anybody wants to use any of the cores, um, all they need to, get, to do is go and talk to the director that can um, help them design in their experiments and then decide how much or how little they want to use the core to help move along their research very quickly. Scientific infrastructure is such that all the basic research departments are housed in five adjacent buildings. Uh, we also have multidisciplinary working groups and there's really a genuine feeling of collaboration and not competition, which allows free exchange of ideas. We also have a variety of different seminars to attend that also helps um, interactions and collaborations. This just lists some of the multi multidisciplinary working groups. Uh, we have five through our NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, some of these are more basic in nature. Some of them help bring together the clinical faculty and the basic scientists to help in the development of new translational research projects. We're WHO collaborating centers for both childhood cancer and global influenza surveillance and response. And then we also have a children's infection defense center that helps bring faculty together from institutions um, within Memphis. I'm a member of the Office of Academic Programs and we're really dedicated to ensure that all our trainees receive the maximum benefit from their time at St. Jude. Uh, we're involved with recruitment, relocation, immigration assistance, continuing education and training, and also career development and placement. Postdocs um, um, receive uh, very competitive benefits. Our salary starts at above um, the NIH scale. Uh, we also have three T32 training grants currently, and we're planning for these to expand. Uh, currently, we have one in um, uh, cancer survivorship, um, infectious diseases, therapeutics, and hematological malignancies. Postdocs also uh, receive a lot of competitive benefits, including um, retirement, uh, professional development allowance, and a sign-on bonus. And postdocs can be at St. Jude for a maximum of uh, five years. Uh, life beyond the bends, there's a lot of continuing education available, including clinical shadowing programs. Uh, we have teaching and mentoring opportunities for them, including becoming an adjunct faculty at Rhodes College, allowing them to do some teaching there. We have a very active postdoc council. Uh, postdocs are eligible to be on institutional committees. And there's a lot of volunteering opportunities as well, both within St. Jude and external outreach that really helps the postdocs come together and, and build a great postdoc community. Just want to point out that if you if anybody's interested in joining St. Jude as a postdoc, um, traditionally you can contact faculty directly and certainly um, please go ahead and do that if there's one specific faculty member that you're interested in. However, at St. Jude in the Office of Academic Programs, you can apply through us and we can help uh, send your CV to the faculty. Um, if you're interested, um, please contact either this email address here, postdoc at stjude.org, or myself. Um, this is my email address and uh, we can help you uh, find a lab that's a good fit for you. This, e this website here can give you a list of all of the actual the faculty who can train postdocs at St. Jude. So it's a little different from the, um, the total faculty numbers. But I will go ahead and stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. That was a terrific overview of all of the dynamic programs uh, at St. Jude. Um, I think if people have questions, it's uh, really helpful that you have your email here. Um, and perhaps if people could go ahead and put them in the chat um, and we'll shift to uh, the first talk uh, from Greg Armstrong. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce uh, 
Dr. Greg Armstrong, who's the co-leader of the Cancer Control and Survivorship Program at St. Jude, and the principal investigator of the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, which is one of the world's premier cohorts of childhood cancer survivors and has really paved the way for uh, learning a lot about the long-term outcomes among children with cancer. Um, so Greg, over to you. Okay, great, uh, can you see my screen, Lindsay? Yes, looks good. Okay, and is it in uh, presenter mode? Because it doesn't it's, look like mode to me. It's not yet in the... Okay. Um, How's, uh, here we go. So, um, yep, perfect, looks great. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you for the introduction. And it really is an honor to talk to you about the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study and specifically about late effects of radiation therapy. We'll cover the survivorship and long-term effects work here at St. Jude as we do this, um, and we can't do it in 10 minutes. So I'm just gonna give this a glancing blow. And before I even start, I just wanna thank many of our collaborators, including Lindsay and Todd Gibson and Amy Barrington at the DCEG. We've now had decades of collaborative work together, uh, and it's an honor to, to share some of their work here too. So the CCSS was funded in 1994. It's a retrospective cohort uh, that was expanded uh, to include now children diagnosed between 1970 and 1999. They're all five-year survivors of their cancer to be eligible, and it includes most common pediatric cancers. And it has a detailed treatment exposure assessment, and um, I'm sorry, detailed treatment exposure capture and a wide range of outcomes. There's over 38,000 eligible and 25,000 actively participating. Now, uh, with you know, 27 years of history, we've had multiple publications and abstracts and so on and so forth. But what's key here is that this is a multi-institutional effort. 31 children's hospitals across the country have contributed uh, their patient population. Now, basic methodology of the cohort is that our survivors complete a questionnaire, uh, PROs or self-reported outcomes for most outcomes. We did abstract treatment information at each of the 31 institutions with medical record abstraction and radiation therapy records were sent to MD Anderson, our radiation physics center, led by Marilyn Stovall historically and more recently by Rebecca Howell. And uh, uh, additionally, we have a repository for buccal cell DNA and blood, a pathology center that confirms second malignant neoplasms. We uh, link with the National Death Index and very importantly, we have a sibling cohort for comparison. So with all that as background, when we focus on radiation dosimetry, the process in this large cohort is abstraction of patients' RT records, that happens at MD Anderson, um, reconstruction of RT fields onto age-specific phantoms, again, historically developed by Marilyn Stovall and carried forward by Rebecca Howell. They calculate dose to both regions and organs of interest and then do quality assurance. I would love to spend more time on this, but because this is a 10 minute talk, I'm gonna go right to one example, which is a Wilms tumor case where you can see uh, the translation of patient chart data to reconstructed fields on age specific phantoms. So the first is of course a picture of uh, the field that's outlined on the patient's abdomen, the second a drawing, but the uh, C and D are frontal and sagittal views of the phantom showing uh, the reconstruction. And it also highlights the, that we have body region dosimetry. So for example, chest, abdomen, pelvis, but also organ specific dosimetry. So uh, this would be uh, for dose calculation to the heart and the pancreas, as you can see. So with all that as context, one of the key outcomes for which radiation uh, is important to incorporate are second neoplasms or subsequent neoplasms. From our original cohort, the first 14,000 participants, we now with a long, long time follow-up can identify that 22% will develop a subsequent neoplasm by 30 years and 11% will develop a subsequent malignant neoplasm. So not benign, but, but a malignant and aggressive. So clearly an income, uh, an outcome with a high prevalence. So let's talk about a few of the key historical publications in the field. Um, the first were really to look at dose risk relationships for tissue specific radiation exposure. And in this case, both CNS tumors as second cancers and thyroid cancer. So in the first led by Joe Neglio back in 2006, he identified a linear dose response relationship for high-grade glioma as a second brain tumor in the CNS and meningioma as a second radiation related brain tumor in the central nervous system. They have distinct slopes and of course, increasing dose clearly associated with increasing risk. Now a slightly different uh, dose pattern and risk pattern as you see, uh, here for thyroid cancer, a linear exponential fit was the better fit for this data, suggesting that above 20 gray, there's actually a decline in the risk for thyroid cancer due to what is uh, thought to be a cell kill process or a cell kill model that such that at these higher doses, the doses that might someday become malignant were actually destroyed. 
Now, this is the very early work. And then uh, I think very important would be to highlight breast cancer as well, where Peter Inskip from the DCEG back in 2009 also identified a linear dose response relationship for secondary breast cancer. In fact, by 40 gray, 11, there was an 11-fold increased risk uh, for developing breast cancer. In addition, Peter also was able to identify that among women who had an ovarian dose of greater than five gray, there was a markedly reduced risk of breast cancer due to the reduction of the hormonal milieu that could drive those cancers. So um, very, very important findings that uh, have been built upon. So how have they been built upon? Well, more recently, uh, in investigators such as Lenny Viega and Amy Barrington from the DCEG have looked at a anthracycline chemotherapy and how it interacts with radiation. In a nested case control study of 271 women with subsequent breast cancer, they identified an odds ratio for breast cancer increasing with cumulative dose anthracycline such that the odds ratio per 100 milligrams per meter squared increase of anthracycline was 1.23. But very importantly, they stratified the, this analysis uh, they looked at those with radiation and no anthracyclines and those with radiation and did have anthracycline exposure. No surprise that for women without anthracyclines and had more than 10 gray, there was an increased risk for breast cancer. But look at that uh, near doubling of risk with anthracycline exposure, clearly identifying that anthracycline chemotherapy increases risk for breast cancer in an additive way above and beyond that of radiation alone. So very important findings. Now, one could ask, how long does the effect of radiation really last and increase risk for subsequent neoplasms? Well, Lucy Turcotte showed in 2015 that even among survivors who are beyond age 40, radiotherapy uh, is associated with an among those who receive radiotherapy, there was an increased cumulative incidence of subsequent neoplasms compared to the population over 40 with no radiotherapy. In fact, this was a more than two four, twofold increase in risk. So uh, still causing effects decades down the road. Important studies have also looked at what have reductions in radiation given us. And so in this study of childhood ALL, comparing patients treated with 1970s-like therapy that had 20 gray of cranial radiation compared to 1990s standard risk-like therapy with no cranial radiation, Stephanie Dixon identified, looked at subsequent malignant neoplasms and identified that these um, SIR, the uh, was 1.0 for that 90s standard risk group. Of course, much higher for earlier groups who had cranial radiation. Uh, but this identified, oh, and the excess risk was zero as well. So this clearly identified that the risk for subsequent malignancy more than five years after treatment for ALL for 1990s standard risk survivors was no different from that in the general population. So that elimination of cranial radiation uh, so really eliminating risk. Now, this population is still aging and may develop risk with time, so we'll keep a close eye on this, but an important finding. It's not just second cancers, however. We have to think of cardiac disease and its association with radiation. This is data looking at coronary artery disease, and you can clearly see that survivors who've had chest-directed radiation have a higher cumulative incidence of coronary artery disease compared to those with no RT or to the sibling population. And the same is true for heart failure. Those with radiation plus anthracyclines or uh, radiation alone higher than the sibling or those with no, no exposure. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to close with this, the big picture. You know, the ultimate outcome here is mortality, and uh, we want to see our survivors live long, full lives. Uh, so we looked a few years ago at cause-specific mortality, specifically what we call health-related causes of mortality. And we identified that for those survivors diagnosed in the 1970s, the 15-year cumulative mortality, health-related cause mortality was 3.1%. Now, to be clear, health-related causes are, um, you know, causes other than the primary cancer recurring. So second cancers, cardiac disease, pulmonary disease, really treatment-related diseases. Um, but we saw with time that survivors diagnosed in the 1980s had a reduction in 15-year cumulative mortality. In the 1990s group, those diagnosed in the 90s, uh, even further reduction. So the question here is not what, not why that, not that this happened, but what caused it. Um, and so there were temporal changes, as you can imagine, in radiotherapy exposure across these decades. For ALL, for example, 85% of ALL survivors from the 1970s had cranial radiation, compared to only 19% from the 1990s. And similar reductions you can see for Hodgkin's lymphoma and Wilms tumor. So did those reductions, uh, were they part of the cause and the improvement in survival? Well, here we looked at treatment intensity decreasing along with 
the 15 year cumulative mortality, which shows that there may be an association. But the most important evidence was looking at a model, um, a model unadjusted for therapy. The treatment error effect was 0.88. Uh, so a 12% reduction with every five years of time. But when we inserted treatment into the model, we anticipated that if treatment was driving this reduction in mortality, it would attenuate this relative risk. And in fact, that's exactly what we saw with treatment in the model. It attenuated the relative risk completely. Uh, and that included cranial radiation and anthracycline. So clearly, I think we can make the jump to say that these reductions in therapy over time, including radiation, are leading to uh, longer lives. So with that, I'll stop and remind you that the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study is an NCI-funded resource to promote and facilitate research among long-term survivors of childhood cancer. And it is an open resource for all investigators interested in survivorship research. We're eager to hear from you, and our website is here. Happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Greg. That was a terrific whirlwind tour of some of the most important findings from CCSS. Um, so people can go ahead and uh, raise their hands or put questions in the chat. Um, I'm gonna start out with one, which is, it was really terrific to see the um, impacts of changes in treatment over time um, on long-term outcomes in childhood cancer survivors. Can you just talk a little bit about your perspective about kind of the opportunities and challenges in radiation dose reconstructed, reconstruction and radiation epidemiology in this population as those changes have continued? Um, even over the two most recent decades. Right, well, there's challenges even with this old era, 1970 through 99, there's still more we can do. We can understand dose volume better. Uh, we started to do that with, with cardiac. We can uh, understand substructures better. We're doing that. Uh, this summer at ASCO, James Bates will have a very nice presentation about looking at risk based on radiation and cardiac substructures, valves and uh, vessels. And so that'll be, I think that will take us even further than what we know. But going forward, there are major challenges. This cohort was developed in a time period that predated um, um, IMRT, for example, and conformal radiation. So there's very little conformal RT. So, um, you know, Rebecca and many others are working on techniques uh, to comparably uh, reconstruct those in a way that would allow us to compare to these older decades, which is very important. Uh, there has to be some comparability there. So uh, major challenges. And I, I think Rebecca, I hope she'll be talking at some point and uh, go into deeper dive on that because that's a talk in and of itself, of course. Yeah, the MD Anderson group has been um, very involved in ISO Red, and I'll put an announcement at the end for other groups. We have some, or some upcoming seminars, um, and then I'll put in the contact information um, for other groups to, to volunteer to present. Um, so I wanted to read out a question um, that was put in the chat by Robert Hayes. Uh, so this says, I have seen some recent literature pointing out that at low doses, the fear-based effect from radiophobia can increase risk due to stress effects alone. Would these effects also play out here? Patient fears from cancer increasing their probability in a measurable way. Hmm, that's very interesting. I'm not familiar with that literature. Uh, I would have to say though, in this period, there's not that many low doses. You know, I don't, I mean, we. We can identify populations who had off-target doses that were low, but uh, most of the treatment doses in, during this era were still fairly high. So I think I probably have to know more about that literature to really understand the question, but uh, it sounds very interesting. Yeah, and the question, um, I know that it doesn't actually necessarily include the specific outcome. And one of the things that I thought was great about your talk, Craig, was that it, it highlighted a whole range of um, adverse effects from radiotherapy. So it's not just one particular outcome like subsequent neoplasms, but it's also cardiovascular disease and others. And that's certainly been a theme um, in the webinars to date. So I think understanding that literature with respect to specific outcomes would be important. Um, one of the next questions in the chat is, what's preventing us from doing prospective rather than retrospective studies? Well, it's a retrospective cohort. That means we went back in time after they had been diagnosed, after they had been treated, and after they'd survived at the five-year time point. Uh, and we captured them at some point beyond that five-year time point. But it is also prospective. We have followed them forward now for 27 years. So uh, this, this is a retrospective cohort with longitudinal prospective follow-up. So, so it's really quite both. Um, um. So I guess, for example, we, uh, we're completing our follow-up seven study now. So that means uh, that's the seventh follow-up from after the baseline. So that will mean eight time points over 
27 years where we've collected outcomes prospectively. And it's actually led to a whole generation of longitudinal studies, data where we've um, uh, published not cross-sectional, but longitudinal outcomes uh, that have been really game-changing. So Rebecca Howell um, has put a couple of comments in the um, chat. I don't know, Rebecca, if you want to speak up. Um. Sure, Lindsay, I can I can sort of make some some comments um, on the questions regarding um, moving this forward. I mean, there are a lot of challenges as we think about this, but I think as Greg mentioned, one of the important things is that we need to think about um, comparability, right? So we can't just jump into new paradigms and all of a sudden switch computational phantoms without um, careful understanding of uncertainty analysis and other things. So um, there's a lot of things to consider. I have several PhD students working specifically on dosimetry projects. Um, and so we'll definitely present at a later time to kind of give some people some insight into the challenges um, moving forward, but also how we can overcome those. It sounds great. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so, Greg, I want to say thank you again, um, and we'll move on to the next talk. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lydia Wilson, who's a postdoctoral research associate at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Um, she's going to be presenting on building a database to support the future of population-based radiation studies. Um, and as uh, Dr. Wilson is getting set up, I wanted to just say um, <clears throat> a special thank you to her um, I have the opportunity to moderate this webinar because I'm part of the webinar working group of the ISO-RED uh, Society. And Lydia has also been really active in ISO-RED uh, and partnered with me to organize all of this. So we're really indebted to you, Lydia, for um, helping to put this webinar together. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Um, can you see my slides okay? We can. And you can hear me and see me. Awesome. Yep. So thank you all so much for tuning in today. I'm ex super excited to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our recent efforts to build a database that we hope will support future radiation studies. So as Dr. Armstrong was just talking about, improvements in cancer care are enabling more and more children diagnosed with cancer to survive longer than ever, with survival rates steadily approaching 85%. Unfortunately, studies like those that Dr. Armstrong was just talking about have also revealed that the survivors of childhood cancer are at a high risk for wide ranging chronic health conditions, many of which are associated with their radiation therapy exposures. Now studies aiming to continue improving survival rates while minimizing the possible long-term health complications require detailed radiation exposure information for large populations of patients. And the need and the challenge with accumulating data for many, many patients inspired a 2010 paper that advocated for the adoption of a data pooling culture, or one where we could accumulate data over time in order to continuously improve our understanding of the side effects of radiation therapy exposures. Yet, here we are 11 years later, and we still find ourselves suffering from a data loss paradigm, one where new data are collected, analyzed, published, and then simply discarded. So we never actually achieve those really high patient numbers that would facilitate vast improvements to our understanding. Now, to be fair, there are several technical barriers to adopting this data pooling culture, not the least of which is the fact that as our technologies and treatments have evolved, which is exactly what's enabled these improvements in cancer survivorship, so too has the type and the format of the associated exposure data. So here you can see some examples of exposure data from treatments over the years that St. Jude has been treating patients. And what you'll notice is that we've gone from paper charts and manual treatment plans to computerized treatment plans where the treatments are simulated on an image of the patient and then the dose is calculated and viewed in this color wash shown over the image. Now, while we've used that same general method ever since the mid 90s, it's transitioned to more and more sophisticated programs over the years. So we find ourselves in the situation where we have just massive amounts of extremely valuable data that may all be organized in their own individual way, but with no overarching standard to facilitate the pooling of this data. 
And in many cases, the people who originally organized and curated these data are no longer here. So for us to now go back and dig through everything, it can really feel like there's no organizational system at all. So our long-term vision was to implement the infrastructure and processes that would enable a data pooling culture here at St. Jude. Now, considering what the infrastructure would look like and what processes would be most helpful to us, we recognize that this problem is not unique to radiation oncology. So we looked to the larger field of data science to see how we should proceed. And one of the first things that we found is that the vast majority of a data scientist's time is spent on, spent on collecting and cleaning data. And that also happens to be the least enjoyable part of a data scientist's job. So that really just sealed the deal for us that this is what we need to be targeting with our infrastructure. And so we set out to design and implement a workflow to cumulatively collect radiation exposure information and combine it with historical exposure information in order to create a master database for future studies. Now, in order to ensure that our workflow was as robust and as useful as possible, we systematically considered the four primary characteristics of big data, which is also known as the four Vs of big data, the volume, velocity, variety, and veracity of the data. So we started out down here with the variety of the data. What types of data do we need? And to answer this, we considered two primary questions. First, what do we need now for any current or currently planned projects? But also, what might we need later so that we don't have to go back and redo this again in just another couple of years? We want everything that we might need for the foreseeable future ready to go in our database. And what we settled on was that the essential components would include an image of the patient, a structure set or a file that designates which areas of that image correspond to which tissues in the patient, and then the planned exposure information. And this would include the radiation dose as well as other physical characteristics of the radiation exposure that might also be relevant to outcomes. So now that we know what data we need, we moved on to consider how much we needed or the volume of the data. And for this, we grappled with the so-called Goldilocks dilemma. What amount of information is just right to facilitate our studies? You can imagine that if we store everything, it would require an absurd amount of storage and it would be really slow to dig through and actually extract information from. But on the other side, if we don't store enough, then we'd end up with a useless database that doesn't actually contain the information that we need for our studies. And so in the end, we decided that we want just a single summary of each patient's entire treatment. So for a patient's entire course of radiation treatment, which typically spans about a month and might include multiple modifications, we decided to store only their most complete and most recent image, a standardized set of structure contours, which that standard is set by the American Association of Physicists in Medicine, and then their composite exposure information. So now we know what we want to store and how much we're going to store. So we now we needed to consider how that data would flow into the database or the data velocity. And for this, we actually have two versions of our workflow. So we have a team who's working on pulling and compiling all the historical radiation therapy data. And then we've also implemented a process by which new patients undergoing treatment now get added to the database as soon as they complete their treatment. So now that we know what we're storing, how much we're storing, and we have a way for that data to flow into the database, we finally shifted focus to the quality of the data or the data veracity. And this is arguably the most important part of our workflow because we need to ensure that future researchers can be confident of the accuracy and the appropriateness of the data in the database if they're going to use it for their studies. Now, the two main things that we wanted to check were that the composite exposure information matches what is in the patient's electronic medical record, and then also that those standardized structure sets actually match the published standard and that they're correct. 
Now, because this is such a critical step, we built a redundancy into this part of the workflow where we first have an automated check that will flag any readily recognizable problems before everything goes to a manual check by a clinical physicist. So that physicist is facilitated by the automated flags, but they're not reliant on them. Now we started defining this workflow just about two years ago, and we've already accumulated data for nearly a thousand children who received radiation treatments here at St. Jude or at one of our collaborating sites. All of their data are standardized and validated in a searchable database. And this effort has already enabled one publication and is facilitating the workflow of an ongoing clinical trial, as well as several other studies here in our department. So the promising progress of these efforts demonstrate that it is feasible to implement a data pooling culture by carefully designing and implementing robust, well-defined workflows, by engaging a variety of stakeholders at key points in the process, and also by remaining persistent in your implementation, even when it seems daunting. Such a culture of accumulating data and making it readily accessible to researchers has the potential to improve cancer care by enabling continued developments to increase survival rates and minimize the health complications for long-term survivors of cancer. I'd like to acknowledge all the various clinicians and scientists and researchers who have contributed and who are continuing to contribute to this ongoing effort. And I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Um, that was great and very thought provoking about um, how to incorporate radiotherapy into some of these large database infrastructures. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the chat already. Um, can you expand a little bit? You talked a little bit about data quality, but can you talk more about measurements of data quality? Yeah, so as of right now, we're mostly just checking to make sure that the treatment that is getting added into our database is what was actually delivered to the patient and it's a summary of their entire treatment. So we, you know, if a, treat, if a patient had a treatment modification, we're not accidentally putting in only part of that before it was modified or applying the, you know, only the modified part to their entire treatment or something like that. Um, but other than that, these are the planned treatment, uh, like the treatment plans, the dose that's calculated by the treatment planning system. So the accuracy of those calculations um, are something that is calibrated when we first start using the treatment machine and the treatment planning system. So that's not something that we are going back and editing on the back end. I will say that looking forward, there is certainly a difference between the planned treatment exposure and what's actually delivered to the patient. And uh, that will be the topic of the next talk that you will be hearing, making sure that you know what what we put into these databases and what we have to go off of matches the delivered dose and not just the planned dose. So it's a great question, but I don't want to steal the thunder of the next talk. Um, so uh, uh, do you think we'll ever be able to avoid the manual check for each data set? Ooh, that's also a great question. Uh, I, I don't want to cause any risks here. I personally don't think we'll ever be able to fully automate all of this. Um, there are a lot of, I was in a web or a workshop that was about data mining and data science and stuff. And even if we could relatively reliably have these automated systems checking things, there will always be cases where they don't work. And so we need to make sure that we're always looking out for those and also that we don't become de-skilled in identifying and fixing those things if we just let computers do everything, which wasn't something that I thought was really that um, real of a problem, but other I'm hearing that other fields are already experiencing this where they've let the reins go too much to computers and when issues arise, there's no one who knows how to fix it or catch it. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about your plans to scale up this initiative since you have about a thousand patients now, are you planning to do the same for previously collected data? Yeah, exactly. So we, our approach has been to work through previous cohorts who are on older clinical trials that were hosted here at St. Jude. So we're kind of working through clinical trial by clinical trial, 
trying to pick the ones that were the most accessible and then that would kind of give us the biggest bang for our buck in terms of initial efforts paying off in initial publications. Um, but as we move forward and the workflow gets more well defined, people are better trained at it, we'll certainly be expanding it out to other clinical trials that are perhaps, you know, in those really old storage systems and less well organized. Um, and then, like I said, we have the workflow to be adding in patients who are getting their treatments now in real time. So we hope that this will continue scaling up and growing as we continue treating patients every day as we do anyway. Um, so uh, how did you uh, decide on the structure set? So were the data already collected in the planning CTs or are they being drawn on retroactively? Yeah, you know, that's a part of the process that I haven't had a ton of involvement in, but my understanding, so we do have structure sets that were already created for the patients when they were planned. Um, my understanding is that for many of them, we've gone back and completely redone the structure set. So we have some staff scientists here who have been running Atlas-based like automatic contouring and then going and manually checking all of those. Uh, so many of them have been redone. The big thing with following the standard for the structure sets, though, is that when you do combine data, if you want to use it in a data mining, with a data mining approach, you need to have all of the same, you know, everyone's brain needs to be labeled exactly the same. And you need to be sure that when you search for brain, you're getting the same structure for all patients. So even for more recent patients where the structure sets contain everything that we want them to contain, and you know the people who did them are still here and we can be sure that they're correct in what we want, we still need to go back and fix those naming conventions for large data mining type studies. Um, <clears throat> so there are a few more questions. It's great this generated a lot. Um, I even have some, but I won't. I, um, well, uh, maybe I'll put mine in the chat as well. Um, but the, uh, it's clear this is a topic that per, this group is really interested in, <clears throat> so we should think about that for future webinars. Um, can you talk about whether there's a plan to link the treatment plans with any biospecimens? Ooh, that is such a great question. The database that we're using right now has the option of linking stuff like that. We haven't gone into that yet, and St. Jude certainly has biospecimen banks. Uh, this is another thing that I don't have any involvement in, but I know it exists and the infrastructure exists to be able to link those things up, but we haven't gotten there yet, but we should, you're right. That's a great point. Um, and then the last one, uh, reflecting this great Epi community that's um, contributing here. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the issues with data missingness? Oh gosh, data missingness. So, um, to be honest, I haven't, I haven't come across that so much because these are all patients who were treated at St. Jude or on St. Jude clinical trials. Thus far, as far as I'm aware, we have pretty much everything that we need. Um, but I'm also not the clinical physicist who's going and checking everything. So they would be way more able to speak to that. I guess I only see the things that worked out well. So I'm sorry, I can't answer your question. <laughs> That's okay. So if people have other questions, if you could go ahead and put them in the chat and then um, maybe Lydia, you could go ahead and respond to them just in the chat. Absolutely. And I'll also um, put I, my email in the chat so people can contact me if they wanna talk more. That would be great. Um, and so then it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce our final speaker, uh, Francesca Caputo, who's a graduate student, um, who's going to be presenting on the pipeline for verifying proton therapy doses in vivo. Um, and I've been particularly excited to, to introduce uh, Francesca as we think about one of the goals of these webinars um, to showcase kind of the uh, individuals with different disciplines and at different stages in their career at each institution who are contributing to this area of research. Hello, my name is Francesca Caputo and today I will introduce you a pipeline for in vivo proton therapy dose verification that St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and I started to develop last year for my master's degree thesis. So we know that there are clinical cases where there are body resistant or solid tumors 
And in these cases, products can be more suitable to treat these tumors themselves. And um, this is related to the fact that the proton beam can be better shaped according to the tumor size, location and dimension. And what we are really interested in is the proton range, which is the maximum depth of penetration of protons in matter. And the importance uh, is uh, linked to the fact that shortly before being stopped, proton will, re will release their maximum of energy and we want to spare nearby healthy tissues or critical organs. But there can be some range uncertainties that will make some difference between differences between the uh, actual proton range, the real proton range, and the expected one. And these range uncertainties are related to the fact that the patient can gain or lose weight during the treatment, or the patient is, of course, breathing during the treatment. So organ motions can induce some range uncertainties. Or for example, there are for example, there are some errors in the patient positioning on the treatment couch. So we need a tool that will enable us to understand where proteins are stopped. And we can try to exploit one of the interaction of proteins with matter, which means with the patient. And this is the production of the beta radioisotopes. So from this radioisotope can emit a positron, which will annihilate with an electron, electron of the medium. And this will produce a pair of photons. Uh, these photons can be detected through the nuclear imaging technique called positron emission tomography or PET and the PET image can provide us an activity map. So we can try to find a correlation and not so straightforward actually correlation between the activity map and the dose distribution, obtaining training to trying to obtain information about the proton range. So the PET image can be acquired during the treatment and this is called the online method shortly after the treatment, so the PET CT scanner is transferred into the treatment room, and this is called the in-room method, or the patient can be transferred from the treatment room to the PET CT scanner room, and this is called the offline method, and this is also the method that Senju implemented for this project. So after the PET the measured PET images have been acquired, we can compare them with the simulated PET images obtained with the Monte Carlo codes, and especially we use Fluca. So Fluca is a powerful tool that will provide us the activity maps obtained after the simulation of the interaction of products with the patient. And we can compare these PET images with the measured ones, and we can try to better understand the range uncertainties. And eventually we can try to reduce the safety margins around the tumor. So the goal of this project is to develop a semi-automatic tool for proton range verification, making this comparison possible. And for the PET, for the simulated PET images, we use the Fluca Monte Carlo code, while for the measured PET images, we use a PET CT scanner after the proton therapy treatment. The target of this project are all the patients whose tumors have been treated with proton therapy. Uh, so the pipeline, uh, very quickly, is uh, made of three steps. So we developed the tool first, then we decided to test it for those comparisons. And this will enable us to understand if Fluca is a robust tool to make these comparisons possible. And then we did some activity tests. So for those comparison, we use these geometries, this geometry in which an incoming beam is coming from the left to the right and is interacting with the water target along the positive Z direction. So the dose comparison has been made with an in-house gamma tool, which will provide us information about the agreement between the Fluca dose and the measured dose. So the comparison is made of three steps. 
In the first one, there is a comparison of a, a 2D slice of the three-dimensional dose distribution, and the plane is orthogonal to the beam direction. So from the color washout, we can see that in blue, we have low dose value, while in red, we have a high dose value. And from this example, we can see that there is at this point no significant difference in the deposit dose. Um, so in the second step, we compare the lateral beam profile and in the X and Y direction. And this is really important because we want to understand if we are overexposuring the nearby healthy tissues and if we are giving so an extra dose. And in the third step, we can see that there is uh, the comparison and evaluation, better, it's better saying, of the evaluation of the gamma indices. And this will give us the information about the pass rate, which is a kind of estimation about the agreement between the fluca dose and the measured dose. And we run several gamma tool, we, got, we run several tests, and we saw that the agreement was an excellent agreement. So we made the next step towards the activity um, maps. So Fluca requires some information to make these simulations possible. And first of all, uh, we want to faithfully reproduce the experimental irradiation setup. So we want to know how long the proton beam was active during the treatment and the time required by the patient to be transferred from the treatment room to the PET CT scanner room. Then we have to take into account that there is the biological washout, like diffusion or perfusion, which are um, physiological phenomena, will decrease the activity concentration of the beta radioisotopes inside the patient. And then we have also to take into account that there is a difference in the activity concentrations between the diagnostic PET and the post-treatment PET. And the difference is about two order of magnitude, which means that when we will study the simulated PET images and the measured PET images, we have a lower activity and so a higher background. So the uh, geometry for the first test is the same as before. We simulated an incident proton beam interacting with a PMMA target uh, and the beam is coming towards the positive set direction. And this is the activity map for a proton pencil beam of 180.40 MeV of energy. And so what we can see is that the uh, color washout is the same as before. So we have a very high activity along the beam path as we are expecting from literature and from previous experiments. But this is also a non-realistic geometry because the patient is not an homogeneous medium. So this is just a test to evaluate how the tool is working. Uh, the final goal is to run our tool and, and to evaluate our tool over realistic geometries. And this is a PET image that we are uh, aiming to obtain. So the beam in this, mm, in this situation is coming from the right to the left and we have this activity pattern. And this is a fused PET CT image, which means that first we acquire a CT image of the patient and then we fuse it with, a, with the PET image. So Fluca, we can say the Fluca is a powerful Monte Carlo code for those estimations. And we are hoping also for activity estimation, even if from the previous uh, test, we can say that. And from this, those comparisons, a very promising agreement is been, has been obtained uh, between um, the semi-automatic tool and the measured dose distribution. But at this point, no quantitative assessment between of proton range has been made or not or any comparison between the measured and simulated PET images uh, has been performed. So the next step is to evaluate more complex geometries and to evaluate uh, the tool over the patient. So thank you for been listening to me. If you have any question, please do not hesitate to ask. Okay. Hello. Thank you so much, Francesca. That was terrific. Oh, thank you. <laughs>
Um, so there's already a question in the chat. Um, yes. Is there any advantage to using other Monte Carlo codes for the proton dose deposition than the one you used? Okay, so we decided to use Fluca Monte Carlo code because it provides to us a user friendly graphical interface, which is Flare, and this will help us to obtain all the results very quickly and compare with Gen4 Monte Carlo code and all the literature about the a creating a pipeline for proton therapy dose verification is at this point like with Fluca and we didn't use Gen4 and so we just use it and then I saw maybe another question about like neutrons and uh okay and proton that those profiles so at this point we made some comparisons for the therapeutic dose so we didn't consider all the other secondary particles like for example neutrons so we just considered all the primary particles like protons are there any other questions Okay, um, well, there's been quite a bit of activity. Um, so it's just a follow up, the idea that eventually the neutron yeah. doses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so there's been quite a bit of activity in the chat. Um, and I wanted to just point out uh, the links to um, the CCSS website, a number of follow ups to some of the other questions. Um, and then, uh, I am going to um, add one more, which is um, to just reiterate from Rania's email uh, chat up above um, that the next uh, webinar in the series is going to be on June 15th at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Um, and we're going to be featuring IS Global in Barcelona. Um, and we really hope that you'll have the chance to join us. Um, That'll be at the sixth webinar. And as I said at the beginning, I think this has been a really fruitful way to achieve the goals of the society of building more community. And so if you're interested in, it, um, in presenting in the webinar series or becoming more involved in ISORED, please email Rania Kosti and I put her email in the chat again. Um, and we'd be delighted to arrange a time to feature your research group as well. Uh, so thank you to everyone uh, for joining and especially to the group at St. Jude for uh, four terrific talks uh, about the training and research there and all of the different um, types of research that are ongoing. It was really great to hear about your dynamic research program. Uh, we hope to see everybody next month uh, for the IS Global presentation on June 15th. Thank you. <laughs>